Ranger in Time, Rescue on the Oregon Trail, Chapter 15, Home. The squirrel crouched at the bottom of the oak tree, its muscles twitching as if it might race back up into the leaves any second. Ranger sniffed the air. He smelled squirrel. He smelled the fresh grass and gasoline twang of Dad's lawnmower. He smelled Luke and Sadie and pizza and somewhere still buried in the garden dirt, a bone from long ago steak. The squirrel twitched again. Instead of running up the tree, it took off toward the picnic table. And before Ranger could even think, he was chasing it, legs flying behind him, ears perked up, nose sniffing ahead of him. Squirrel! They raced three times around the picnic table, through Mom's flowers, across the garden, and then zip. The squirrel raced up the oak tree and vanished into the shaking leaves above. Poor Ranger! Another one got away. Want a treat, boy? Ranger turned and saw Luke open the kitchen door. He bent down and held out his hand with a half slice of bacon in his open palm. Ranger rushed up to him, panting, and gobbled it up. Bacon. Home bacon. Ranger followed Luke inside the mudroom, still licking grease from his muzzle. What's that? Luke reached for the first aid kit that hung around Ranger's neck. Ranger stood still while Luke lifted the strap and studied the rusty tin box. Then he noticed the quilt square and slipped it from under Ranger's collar. Did you dig all this up in the garden? That's pretty cool. Let's show Mom. He started to walk off. Without thinking, Ranger barked. Luke turned his eyes wide. What? Ranger trotted up to Luke and carefully took the leather strap and quilt square in his teeth. He tugged until Luke let go. Okay, fine. You found this stuff. It's all yours. What you gonna do with it? Ranger carried it to his dog bed. Luke laughed. I guess that's a good place to keep your treasures. Good job. You're a good boy, Ranger. He scratched Ranger's ear. Ranger leaned in and wagged his tail. He waited so long to hear those words. When Luke left, Ranger settled into his dog bed. He was tired, but before he went to sleep, he nuzzled the first aid kit. It was quiet now and the humming had stopped. Ranger poked at the kit with his nose until it was tucked into the folds of his blanket. Then he curled up and gave the quilt square a good long sniff. Sam's scent still clung to the fabric. Ranger could smell Ma, too. Her mix of wildflowers and worry. And Lizzie and Amelia and trail bacon and oxen. But mostly Sam. Somehow, Ranger knew Sam was home now, too. The end of Ranger in Time rescue on the Oregon Trail. The author's note. Imagine saying goodbye to your house, almost all of your friends and extended family, and most of your possessions. Imagine leaving everything you know to begin a long, long journey. To a new home in a place you've never seen. The decision to set out on the Oregon Trail must have been a difficult one to make, but thousands of families like the Abbots made that choice in the mid-1800s. Sam and his family are fictional, but their story is inspired by the diaries and journals of many real-life people who wrote a little bit each night as they traveled west on the overland trails that led not only to the Oregon Territory, but also to California and the Great Salt Lake. The trip usually took about five months. That's if everything went well. Bad weather, disease, trouble with livestock could all slow down the pace of travel. Like Sam's family, many people traveled in mixed groups, often with different destinations. In the earliest days of the trail, many families were heading to the Oregon Territory for farmland. Starting in 1846, they were joined by Mormons, like Sarah's family, who were bound for the Great Salt Lake area to escape religious persecution. When gold was discovered in California in 1849, another group of travelers headed west. The Beard Brothers of Travelers are fictional, but they represent the thousands of men, and some women too, who left their homes to search for fortune in the California gold rush. Many people started their journeys in one of the towns known as Jumping Off Points. While Sam's family set off from Independence, Missouri, others chose to leave from 
St. Joseph, Missouri, or Council Bluffs, Iowa. Wherever their trip started, the preparations took much the same. Most families used a guidebook like the one the Abbots carry. Theirs was written by Joel Palmer, who traveled west in 1845 and 1846. These guidebooks suggested routes and strategies. They also gave lists of needed supplies and directions for setting up a wagon. Palmer and all other real-life immigrants wrote about lots of animals in their journals. They described prairie dog towns and buffalo stampedes. They wrote about gathering buffalo dung for fuel, circling wagons at night, and listening to the wolves howl. The Snowball Fight Sam family has in his book is based on one that Margaret Frank described in her 1850 trail diary as she camped near the Platte River in June. Diseases were a constant worry on the trail. The chlora that leaves Sarah an orphan and the mountain fever that nearly kills Sam are just two examples. Today, historians and scientists understand the cause of these illnesses, which are no longer the great threat they were in the 1850s. Today's experts know that unsanitary conditions and contaminated drinking water contribute to the chlora epidemic. They believe tick bites were mostly like the cause of one kind of mountain fever, which we now know as Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. While some pioneer families worried about encounters with Native Americans along the trail, most who traveled around 1850s had experiences similar to the Abbots. More than 20 different tribes lived and passed through the areas around the Oregon Trail. The Sioux and the Shawnee who helped Sam's family were frequently mentioned in real historical diaries from this time period. They traded with travelers, served as guides, and assisted with river crossings. In the later days of immigration, there was more tension. Violence between the groups became more common, especially after the U.S. government had begun sending more soldiers west and some military commanders broke treaties that had been made with the tribes. In researching Ranger and Sam's adventures, I became immersed in diaries, journals, trail guides, maps, and artifacts. The National Frontier Trails Museum and Merle J. Matt's Research Library in Independence, Missouri served as amazing time machines, plunging me back to the days of the Oregon Trail. One of the people I met in those faded journals was Lizzie Charlton, a real-life teenager who traveled west with her family in 1866. Sam's ever complaining older sister was inspired by the real Lizzie's journals. I owe many thanks to those who helped me on my time traveling journey, especially Richard Edwards of the National Frontier Trail Museum, who introduced me to Lizzie via her diary, and Patrick Sutton from the Independence Rock State Historic Site, who told me all about Sam and Ranger's secret cave, and sent me photographs of the names recorded on the rocks inside. Ranger was inspired by the stories of many real-life search and rescue dogs. When I was doing research for Ranger in Time Series, I spent time with Oakland and Easton, who are part of the Chaplin Valley K-9 unit and their handlers, Sharon Bressett and Kelly Gidman. Oakland is a German Shepherd who is an, ain't, is an air scent dog. Even though I'd read so much about these dogs, I was amazed by the focus and excited he was to do his work. Easton is a chocolate lab who uses both air scenting and ground trafficking to find people. He also made quick work of a couple challenges we set up for practicing finding victims in the Adirondack woods. Both dogs found their target scents in the air and followed them to the fallen trees and brush piles where there were scent objects. We're hiding. I was one of those scent jobs. I had run through a field into a thick brush and crouched behind a big old log. I thought I was hidden well, but Easton found me in seconds by following my scent. Like Ranger, these dogs are excited to do their work. They look forward to a roar after a job well done. Their handlers lavish them with lots of petting and praise. Good job, good job, followed by a drink of water. Then, like Ranger, they finally get to go home.